This, I think, is our fourth event, and I think we have two more Lunch and Learns planned for later in this semester. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to say all of them have been well attended. And also, we haven't neglected the critical part of Lunch and Learn, which, as Kate Perizzo just said to me, is lunch. Uh, and so lunch is here. And please, if you haven't got food yet, make sure you go. I said earlier that when this is over, we open the doors. We invite the students to come in. And any leftovers actually disappear incredibly quickly, which is a great thing. Uh, so today's event is, uh, I think, something that uh, uh, is, uh, is really exciting. Um, and I say that only partially because I was involved in it, uh, but mostly because I was involved in it. Uh, so this is a, a, about uh, uh, an innovation uh, in terms of how within the political science department, which is my home department, how we tried to rethink our first year course. Um, and the origins of this came about as a result of, of several kind of pressures that the department was finding in terms of its first year course. Uh, it's a large course, it offers multiple sections, uh, it's trying to meet many different conflicting needs. Uh, the department also has a number of collaborative programs that it participates in that are not just political science majors, but there's criminal justice and public policy, international development, environmental governance, a whole range of these other programs. Um, and for resource reasons, we had actually years earlier um, gotten rid of our first year seminars. So these were large courses, but they were lecture only. Students come in three hours a week, two hour and a half sessions or three 50 minute sessions, and then they leave. And TAs were assigned the course, but really just were marking and grading. And so part of the origin of this came out of a quality assurance report that we had, which said, you need to think about your first year. Uh, you've got a bunch of courses. We have other courses, too, in our first year. Uh, but this course, it's not, it's, it's big. Uh, it's not clear what, what, what it, how it's serving students. And at the same time, that, that report also said, you need to give your graduate students more meaningful opportunities to teach. And your first year students need small group experiences. So there were a, a large number of sort of conflicting kind of and, and, and important uh, requirements that we were trying to address. Um, and so the idea developed to, to try and think about a hybrid course or a blended course in which we actually reduced uh, the face-to-face -face lecture time, increased student engagement and learning through um, a variety of blended our online and small group experiences, which then those small group experiences would be led by graduate teaching assistants. Um, and, and so this was the proposal. We, we received a grant from the Teaching and Learning Innovation Fund to help develop this, and that was critically important. Uh, and then we assembled uh, just the most fabulous team of people uh, who are here uh, and uh, to work on this. And, and I, so they are going to talk more about about how this came about and what the course looks like and the development process. I was involved throughout as well, but I can speak to some of the more administrative challenges in this to a certain extent. So I'll just introduce our panelists, but before I do, I'd also like to say that Natalie Green, who's yes. at the back, was Absolutely. also involved and was from Open Education and yep. was so tremendously supportive right throughout the process um, and also always, uh, I think, kept us honest particularly when I, as a, like I put my administrator's hat on and then I always go, can we cut a corner here? And Natalie was always going, no, we can't cut that corner. We need to think that through. And I'm going, oh, okay, I guess. And then we did. So it was all very good, <laughs> uh, mostly. Or they thought it through. <laughs> I didn't do a lot of thinking. Um, so the panelists today are uh, Dennis York from Open Education. Uh, who was our key team member in terms of developing a lot of the logistics and the support and the technology um, and helping us walk through things like learning outcomes, what it would look like. Um, Nanita Mohan, who is a sessional lecturer in the political science department, uh, who was critical in terms of developing this, but also has now taught the course twice. Is this your third offering you're doing this semester? Uh, uh, Second, yeah, third, third, yes, third, yeah. third time. And Anita has also done uh, several conference presentations 
on this uh, and recently also was uh, successful in, in getting a, a little research grant through the QP Sessional Research Fund uh, to continue working on developing this sort of model. Um, and Carol Dada, a political science faculty member who, ha along with me, are t two of the people who taught the old version of political science 1150 a lot of years. And Carol was also just tremendously important in sort of trying to think through what the content should be, what our objectives were in terms of developing this course. And all of us have been involved in developing the content, various sections of the content of this course. So with that, I think I will turn it on. I, th I think it's Dennis is going to speak first. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Byron, for such a good introduction. And uh, I think we went through very productive uh, collaboration developing this course, and it took us uh, some time to put it all together. Uh, so I'll um, start the presentation by sort of introducing uh, the topic of blended learning, why uh, institutions turn to the blended learning methodology, as well as some of the problematics uh, of the definition of blended learning and what are the key instructional design uh, dilemmas that uh, we often faced when we're thinking about uh, whether the blended learning is uh, uh, appropriate for the uh, course. Uh, today, post, uh, today, uh, public post-secondary uh, institutions are face, uh, facing uh, multiple challenges, such as um, uh, financial cutbacks. Uh, we have a more diverse uh, student population who are uh, often work and commute to the uh, institution. Uh, we also have uh, institution requesting uh, increased uh, sizes of uh, classes. So to address uh, these type of challenges, uh, we often uh, try to think about how to redesign, uh, reconceptualize uh, the learning experience for our students. And the current research suggests that the blended learning could be a viable option as it allows to bring together two environments and provide some flexibility to the students by combining face-to-face -face and the online uh, learning environments. And at the same time, it allows to maintain some of the physical interaction, physical contact between the students and their peers and the uh, instructor. Uh, research also currently suggests that uh, blended learning uh, is more likely to improve uh, student uh, satisfaction and uh, learning performance. Uh, it also improves the uh, mm, retention and it helps to manage uh, classroom space uh, better. And um, we also try to utilize the learning technology uh, to maximize learning opportunities for the students uh, in the online or face-to-face uh, -face environments. Uh, in a recent survey of teachers uh, conducted by Campus Technology, 73% uh, of faculty um, reported that they use blended uh, approach uh, to deliver their courses, while 15% uh, of the faculty still use the face-to-face -face, uh, instruction without any online uh, access. Uh, the National Center for Academic Transformation and uh, their director, Carol Twig, uh, she recommends the institution to actually focus on the large enrollment courses to justify the uh, investment in the redesign because it uh, makes a bigger impact because you have a lot of students uh, taking the first introductory courses. And uh, by doing these redesign initiatives, um, the uh, departments or the institutions, they try to reach more students and uh, scale quickly without uh, sacrificing the huge overhead uh, costs. Uh, it also, as I mentioned, uh, helps to maintain the face-to-face -face, uh, contact with students while providing them with some flexibility, for instance, for the students who commute into the campus often or who have uh, part-time uh, job opportunities. Uh, it also allows to uh, reconceptualize the learning process and focus more on the training and teaching students in applying the concepts uh, and key ideas that they received from the lectures or from the textbook. Uh, and uh, also research suggests that the student satisfaction and the learning performance also is uh, better in the blended courses than in just uh, fully face-to-face. -face. And again, uh, the use of online environment allows us to utilize the technology to maximize uh, learning experience and create more uh, rewarding opportunities for students to utilize the, their knowledge. Uh, so in practice and in the literature, we found um, some problematics in terms of uh, definition of blended learning because blended, the concept of blended learning has, 
have been used for ages, like we've been blending uh, various type of um, activities, uh, resources, different environments, but with online technology, we start blending the actual online and face-to-face -face, uh, learning environments. And different institutions take different stances on how they define uh, blended learning. So it is important for educators and uh, researchers to define what they mean by blended learning. At OpenEd, uh, we conceive blended learning as a meaningful and purposeful integration of these two environments, face-to-face -face and uh, online. And we also subscribe to the idea of replacing uh, meaningfully the face-to-face -face, uh, time with the online time and uh, modifying uh, the approach how we teach um, uh, lectures, for instance, in the classroom uh, to make them more interactive and uh, utilize some active learning um, approaches and then use the online activities also to help students to focus uh, on the concepts and the uh, challenges that they've uh, discovered, let's say, in the uh, lectures to take them a little bit further and dive deeper into the, uh, those concepts. Uh, there is a, also a plethora of different approaches how you can blend the course uh, and what time what percentage of time you would use online or face-to-face. -face. So that also uh, makes it a little bit more complicated in terms of whether there is a template that would be um, successful that we can use for different courses. So there is so many contextual factors that you need to take into account uh, when you're thinking about blended learning because uh, it depends on the discipline you're teaching, depends on the uh, student population that take in the courses, whether they're first year students, whether they're graduate students. So all these uh, factors, they contribute to the way how the blend will be uh, shaped together. So as an instructional designers, uh, we work closely with the faculty members or the course developers to uh, sort of uh, explore uh, the three instructional dilemmas to help, us, uh, to help us gather all the information needed to come up with the right blend uh, for the course. The first one is the learning activities. What uh, learning activities are more suitable for online uh, environment and what learning activities are more suitable for face-to-face uh, -face, uh, environment. There's so many activities out there, there's so many technologies that could be used to support both face-to-face -face and online uh, teaching. So it is important to look at all those activities and the learning outcomes that these activities are trying to uh, support and uh, select the one that are uh, best suited for these uh, different environments. The other thing uh, that we are looking into the relationship between the face-to-face uh, -face and online components, how students are bringing the knowledge that they for instance, were given in the face-to-face -face environment and how they taken it further and build on that in the online environment and vice versa. So it is important to have that meaningful connection between these two different environments to have that progression uh, from one uh, learning activity to another learning activity so the students can see that continuity of the learning events that happen in, in the course. And the third one is the course time. Uh, the literature suggests that if you have uh, 30% from 30% to 79% uh, replaced uh, with the online time, that would be considered a blended course. So it is important also to look at how you uh, distribute the um, hours uh, and how much you devote time to face-to-face uh, -face and online uh, environment as well. So those are the three uh, key uh, questions that uh, we typically go through and uh, the conversation uh, and the decision making that takes uh, some time to uh, collect all that information and come up with the right blend uh, for the instructor and for the course to support the uh, rewarding experiences of students. Okay, I'm gonna go to the chart first, then I'll go back to, to that slide. I love my charts. <laughs> um, so uh, when we started this, uh, one of and one of my main main things, but I think for all of us, uh, was our aim to introduce the student to the discipline of of uh, political science, and that ha has been the aim of the first year course before this iteration as well. Um, and so content was very important to us, and and how content was delivered was very important to us. 
But our aim also was for students to have a variety of ways to access the content and to interact with the content. So that was sort of was the beginning of thinking of our blend, what we were going to blend when it came to face-to-face -face and online. So we wanted to blend both the face-to-face -face and the online, um, uh, taking advantage of both. So for the face-to-face, -face, we wanted to take advantage of the interaction <coughs> of students, both with their instructors, which would be the lecturer and the TA, uh, and their peers. So we wanted that face-to-face -face interaction for uh, those. Online, we wanted to take advantage of just what you're talking about, technology and the variety of ways that we can uh, um, create experiences for students, um, both individual, student, uh, individual experiences and uh, those uh, participating with others, but all to do with the content. So really that continuity uh, within each one of our modules, uh, within each one of our weeks, was really centered around dealing with the content in these ways, in these blended ways. And uh, uh, it, it, it kind of looks easy now, but it wasn't easy. <laughs> uh, we, we had to go at it and create things. So uh, the content, as you can see here, uh, in, we have in red everything to do with uh, content. Uh, where it shows up and how uh, students interact with it. So we had the, le the lecture. Uh, we start the week with the lecture. And the lecture s sets out the main ideas of the content for the week. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's, that's a very important component uh, for the students because they're going to take that content and they're going to work with it variously throughout the week. Then we have what we came to call Diving Deeper. And so uh, one section of the lecture uh, we chose. Um, and when it came to actually uh, you know, devising the nitty gritty of the content, uh, we, were very, we took a lot of time figuring out which, which one we thought we would um, take. And so we take that one part and through uh, online it could be um, a uh, video, um, Byron did a video when it came to ideologies. Uh, it could be um, a commercial video of some sort, a uh, film. It could be um, a lecture. It could be an online lecture that's to do with that content, uh, uh, but very specifically that, that bit of content. Uh, or it could be a voiceover of slides. There are so many ways that you could do that diving deeper. And so that became really the key for our content in, <clears throat> in the online. And then the diving deeper led to um, a dive, diving deeper exercises. So once they had done the diving deeper, they would be directed to something to do that was to do with that content. And it was always to do with some kind of using the content uh, or interacting, an interactive exercise, et cetera, et cetera. So it would be all the way from drag and drop to uh, uh, an online post or something or, or uh, answering some discussion questions which would be in preparation for having a discussion in the seminar. So uh, the important thing was we wanted the diving deeper to be a very important part of the content. It wasn't something that, uh, yeah, maybe I'll do that or not. No, very, very important. Of course, we have more traditional ways through readings uh, as well of getting the content. So having, having that was so important. So I like to say that we created this incredible uh, menu uh, for us to choose from. So for, uh, for every week or every, even every module, we wouldn't have all things. But we have this menu to choose from. And there would be enough continuity of the things that, of course, there will always be a diving deeper. There may not always be a drag and drop exercise that goes with it. it might be something else. But uh, it, there was enough continuity so students weren't just sort of, uh, didn't know quite what to do, but 
to do with it. So very important. So uh, the content then uh, was that. Uh, the interaction for students then, we have interaction in both large and small group uh, for them uh, to have. So we have face-to-face -face interaction and those would be, yeah. Um, I had a question related to content. So if your layout is three one-hour lectures, no, no. I, I we're coming. We're coming to that. Yeah. So we'll get to the nitty gritties of it. I just. This is just sort of an overview of what our task was to try and and create a template from which we could work. But we're we're going to explain to really each one. Answer it. There's one lecture, an hour and a half. Yeah. Day one. Okay. That's a Monday class. Everything else builds to it. With the seminars, with the GTAs towards the end of the week. So everything is scaffolded and linked throughout, but we cut down on face-to-face -face lecture time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so th uh, the interaction then, um, there are group activities and there are individual assignments, right? So they get uh, both, uh, and they get to interact with the content through both the active participatory work and the individual work. So that by the end of the week, they've had several ways of interacting with this content, uh, both face-to-face -face and online, and both uh, interactive and individual work. So uh, the individual work, um, we, you know, we have the um, traditional, um, uh, uh, with the online, we have the traditional online tests. Um, we, we have blogging, we have um, doing a post in your online participation group. So you can go back and forth. As I said, it's kind of a menu to pick from, to, uh, to, to slot in for each week and for our modules. So planning uh, was a big undertaking for us and it took a lot of times and a lot of meetings, a lot of frustrating meetings. I know you can speak to that, Natalie. <laughs> and uh, so if we think that was complicated, try the implementation. And uh, that's Nanitas. <laughs> so all of this looks very pretty in graphs. And you know we had all these colorful graphs in green and red. And then when it came to actually putting things in practice, uh, day one of the first semester, I was like, eh. <laughs> so uh, I'm here to talk about how we actually sort of converted some of the things that Carol and Dennis said into a practical way. And I had the pleasure of teaching this class for the first time two semesters ago. So right now we're in our third offering. And I must say that <coughs> so far, touch wood, it has gone pretty well uh, in terms of feedback from students, the teaching assistants, and just the general um, consistency of this class. So I'm going to talk about, as you know, what you mentioned, how we actually sort of developed a plan to have that consistency in place. So the lectures take place every Monday. Uh, right now we are scheduled for from 5.30 to 6.50, so it's an hour and 20 minutes. And the slides for the lecture are kept very basic, more focused on the theoretical concepts of political science. I don't go into detail, into too much detail, because that's what we have the diving deeper for. And I have an example of a week that I'm going to show you. So basically, during the one hour and 20 minutes, <coughs> I talk about these concepts. Uh, I sort of relate these concepts to the readings. We have a custom textbook that we created for this class. Each week uh, is specific to a chapter from another textbook that we have. Uh, and once again, it's kept at a very basic level. And students are then expected between Tuesday and Thursday to do approximately eight to 10 hours of online activity, online reading, uh, and that's what we call diving deeper. So for example, they would have to watch a video to supplement the lecture. They would have to do a drag and drop exercise to sort of apply some of the theoretical concepts that I talked about during lecture. And then the seminars or seminar tutorials, they're 50 minutes long and they're scheduled for Thursday and Friday. So by Thursday or Friday, depending on when they are registered for the seminar, they will then take the information that they have learned from the, se uh, from the lectures, the diving deeper exercises, and the, the TAs will then sort of provide an activity that will bring everything together. And the TAs have access to their di uh, drag and drop and diving deeper exercises, so they know 
the students have actually done them or if they did it incorrectly, they can bring it up. And I've created different activities for every week so that they can actually apply some of the diving deeper and the lecture material into the seminars. Um, so the seminars are um, right now probably if there was a challenge it would be the seminars because to establish consistency I need to have TAs at the same level. So some TAs do better than the others so right now I would say that that is the only little bit of a bump that we have because you know lecture is always done by myself or whoever else is going to lecture. So there's always that consistency. Diving deeper is the same, but uh, I think one of the the complaints that I have heard is that some TAs you know are better at sort of interpreting the information. Some are you know less enthusiastic, etc. But one semester I had I had what I call my superstar team of TAs, and uh, it was four PhD students, and they were really really good at sort of you know taking the lead. Um, so the other great thing about this class is that we actually have little assessments. So you know not like a 30% midterm or 40% final. Every week they have something going on. And at first I was really afraid because I'm used to teaching a huge class of 400, 500 students where you know the only thing I can really afford to do is two or three midterms, probably a few online blog assignments and a final exam. But for this, we have, um, we have divided the class into four modules. Each uh, module consists of three weeks. So this is a sample of our first module. So week one is power and authority. Week two, ideology and political parties. Week three, representation and democracy. So by putting it into modules, they sort of understand that this class works in four different components. So they know that by the end of module one, they have to have completed a few things. And then at the end of module two, they would have had to complete a few things. So um, from the feedback I got, they actually really like these little components because, first of all, they tend to do much better when they have 5% discussion, 5% quiz. And they also know that because they have to keep up with the readings come to lecture, they, they need to retain the knowledge and they tend to do really well. I think last semester, the average, sorry, Troy, was a little bit high <laughs> for a first year class, but we really couldn't help it. They were really into the material, very enthusiastic, and um, the seminar participation and attendance was you know, really good, as well as the lecture. My lectures on Monday nights are, I would say, at 80, 85% because they know that that's the only time they have to come to learn about the theoretical parts of the course. So uh, these are the other modules. So as I said, our first module was just the basic political power, concepts, ideas. Module two, we get into liberal democratic states. Module three, political participation. Module four, global politics. And um, in terms of distribution of marks, the seminar tutorials are 25%. Um, so they are graded on attendance and participation. There are discussions every week. There are 11 discussions in total. However, they're only graded for four, so one per module. And the most, I think, successful thing about this class is how we've divided the research assignment. So I've taught very big classes, you know, uh, first year classes with four or 500 students. And it came to a point where we really didn't have the manpower to grade uh, any kind of term paper or research assignment. So I had to sort of kibosh that. But with this, uh, because each TA is responsible for <coughs> approximately 40 students, we're actually able to give them the opportunity to teach about how to write a research assignment in four different ways. So the step one uh, is when they have to do a research question, and then step two, an annotated bibliography, and then lit review, and then finally like an opinion piece at the end. But basically the seminars or part of the seminars are taken up to teach them how to come up with the research question, how to write a proper thesis, so that they're a little bit more prepared in the second and third and fourth year. Something that we in political science uh, could not do in first year because of the you know, uh, little large classes and the lack of um, TAs that can help us with that. They have three quizzes. Each quiz is due at the end of every module, with the exception of the last module, because it's close to the final exam. Uh, and the final exam is only worth 20%. And they really like this because there's not a lot of pressure at the end because they can you know, sort of do a little bit along the way. So what I'm going to do right now is show you an example of a week. <coughs> so I'll do the first week. 
So this is how each week looks like. They have an overview, an introduction of what the week is about, learning outcomes, and we've provided them a checklist as well. Uh, and then we've divided it into the in-class, online, and uh, seminar activities. So an in in-class lecture, every week we uh, upload the slides so they have access to the slides. So I'm just going to sort of show you how the first week's slides look like. So as you can see, there's only 11, so 11 slides for uh, an hour and 20 minutes, but they're kept very basic. So for the first week, I talked about, um, for example, Max Weber's ideal types of political authority, so traditional, charismatic, legal, rational, and I'll give them sort of just the basis, uh, basics of what they are. And then what they need to do um, from Tuesday to Thursday is go to the online part and they will then take the information from the lecture and do what we call a uh, drag and drop activity on the different types of political authority. So, um, for example, not dependent on a person occupying a position, that would be rational legal, um, based on line of succession, traditional, um, you know, Queen Elizabeth, she's an example of traditional, cult leaders, charismatic, for example. I hope I got this right. You did. <laughs> and then... I was going, oh. <laughs> yeah, I should, I should know these things. And then you can check them. And um, let's just say um, I, I, I put this in an incorrect. So if I do retry and I do something incorrectly, so if I put this here, I can check and I'll say it's incorrect. So they can do this, and TAs actually have access to this. So they can sort of monitor the progress of each student as well, and the general um, uh, you know, perception of what students are doing in terms of whether they're getting it right or not. And then once they complete this, um, on Thursday or Friday in the seminar, they will, we, we then have activities where they can take this up and talk about why you know Queen Elizabeth is part of the uh, uh, traditional authority, and why you know um, James Jones is not part of traditional. So they they can sort of have an even more um, uh, detailed discussion about the uh, the lecture material as well as the the drag and drop. So just uh, to give you another example of another week, this is the one that Carol created. She has a voiceover. And I didn't know that until now. <laughs> so for this week, once again, uh, our in-class lecture, we have slides uh, that talks about democracy, different forms of democracy, once again, very theoretical. And then online activity. Uh, I don't know. So this is uh, basically uh, extra slides that where she's talking about the different types of representation. And then students will then take, listen to that diving deeper, and then sort of apply uh, the different um, types of um, representation to a quote. So, so for example, the first one, I'm, I'm not even reading, I'm just going to just go there. Let's say it's partisan. back yeah so it's so they can do this exercise and then once again in the seminars the uh, uh, for this particular week they will participate in a debate to determine which type of re representation is better and why and they will also start to work on their research questions so they'll they'll take about 20 minutes the TA will explain what a research question is so they can also start working on that particular research assignment so basically the key here is to always ensure consistency uh, once there is a break in the consistency, then you know, we, we run into problems. Um, and in order to ensure that consistency, uh, we have to stick to those lecture slides and the lecture material in that hour and 20 minutes. Um, and the first time this was offered, that was a bit of a challenge because as we all as instructors know that you know, we never really finish on time and we're always sort of having one or two slides that we take into the next, ter uh, the next week. So in this case, uh, the challenge is to try to get everything done in those time period, and then it will be smooth sailing. Um, so even with the online activity, we don't try to give them too much because they only have approximately eight hours to do everything. And then in the in-class seminars, the TAs make sure that they are ready, and they have to be ready. If they're not ready, then they're falling a little bit behind. So um, 
I guess to say, um, I mean, you know, like the first semester, obviously, we had some, you know, issues with that. But in the second semester, I was able to sort of really convince students that you have to keep track with the readings, with the diving deeper, otherwise it won't sort of balance. And once they sort of got that, it really flowed quite well. Sorry. I have two questions. The yeah. first, do you or the TAs mark the 11 blogs? Uh, the TAs do most of the marking. I do mark a few things uh, just to sort of relieve some of the uh, time. But uh, yeah, the TAs are mostly responsible for 90% of the grading. Okay. Yeah. And there wouldn't be 11 blogs because... No, no, no. no. It's, because it's, it's, we choose. Yeah, they, they only four are graded, but they have the opportunity yeah, to sort of, you know, blog or do a discussion or answer questions every week. And that's also just to sort of keep them you know, um, up to date with the material so that they're not falling behind. And even the non-graded ones, students tend to sort of participate just to sure, ensure that they know the material and then TAs can sort of um, look into that. Yeah. And you said that after the first lecture, they're expected to spend eight to 10 hours of reading. That sounds not, like a lot. Not they, reading, but doing, doing the activities. That wow. includes the textbook so reading. Just, yeah. just on, on that though, the university, guidelines and rules are that a 0.5 credit hour course, 0.5 credit course is 10 to 12 hours of student effort a week. So this is completely consistent with what the university expects. A 0.5 credit course is 10 to 12 hours of student effort. And that is a combination of in class, attending lectures, readings, and other activities. And that's what we've design this around. And I think the key thing here is the student response is really fabulous. We assume the students don't want to do the work. And so we gear our expectations downwards. But in fact, when you create meaningful and engaging exercises and opportunities to participate, students do it. Yeah, and, and, and I'm saying eight to 10 hours is the max, right? Yeah. Like and some weeks it may be some less. Some weeks is less, yeah. Some and it depends on the student. Right, how quickly they Absolutely. get the material, yeah. how much time they need to spend. So it's a varies, right? And out of the eight to 10 hours, like some weeks we have videos that are about an hour, an hour and a half, right? So for them to take notes from the video, for them to sort of do the reading. So that's just, I'm you know, being very liberal with the eight to 10 hours. It's probably less, but. Um, and I think we've been mindful too when we designed it about not trying to overwhelm students, right? It sounds like a lot. But I think we were very kind of cognizant of that. Is that too much to ask for them to do? So, and then it varies, right, because it is a menu as we explained. So the students have different options, different weeks. It, it always looks a little different. There's that continuity and consistency about expectations. But within each week of a module, it varies. So it's not, it doesn't become routinized and boring as a result as well, because there are different elements each week. Yeah. So I mean, and, and Anita, I would just say too that we were very easy on the first week, yeah. and everybody, you know, first week of September, your first year in political or in university. Yeah. So absolutely, yeah. and also like the lectures. Uh, one of the things I did that also got very good feedback is we have uh, four, I guess, including myself, five different instructors that created the content um, for some of the weeks. So what I did was um, I got those instructors or those professors to come and do a guest lecture for the weeks that they created and they really liked that because then they got to see you know who the other faculty members are Troy was uh, has been very uh, nice with his time he also he created the last week and he he comes to guest lecture during the last week and uh, you know students really like it they're they're very engaged and um, you know they they, they kind of like the the fact that there's a little bit of diversity because it's not just me every week you know lecturing <coughs> Um, so lectures are very important because they set up the entire week of activities. And I, and I tell them, I, I use about five minutes in the start of the class to tell them what to expect for the rest of the week. Uh, and then I say, okay, well, some of these things that I'm going to talk about are going to be applied in the Diving Deeper, and then some of that is going to be then applied to the uh, seminar as well. So between the seminars and the uh, Diving Deeper, there's a lot more connection, I would say, than between the lecture and the diving deeper. But you know, you have to sort of try to keep it very basic in the beginning, so that students, when they leave the lecture, they're not supposed to know everything. Where they're going to skip the online part, they're going to be like, "But what about this? Or what about that?" So it's not that I try to discourage questions during lecture, 
but I say, well, you know, maybe this is something that can be taken up in your seminars or your seminar leader can talk about it. Like I do answer factual content question, but I don't try to generate as much discussion during the lecture and just keep it straightforward with lecture. Should we open up to questions. Yeah, so I'm, yeah, I was just going to, this is my last slide here, but basically it's just what I was trying to say, how the diving deeper material for each module uh, goes into more detail of what the lectures and the textbook is all about. So questions. So um, should I Thank you. take the mic to people? Yeah. So we're, we're podcasting these and recording them so that they can go on our website as a resource for people who might not have been able to be here. So I have the job of, of being Oprah Winfrey and passing <laughs> on the mic to people. Well, thank you. Do you have any data that shows the different grades between different groups? Uh, and how then do they compare to the final exam grade of each student? Sorry, what do you mean by groups? So let's say you have five different seminar leaders. Yes. They all oh, give you yes. a list of yeah. grades. I, do they differ between I themselves? I am collecting that. I, I did that for the first semester just to see. The first semester was great. That was the, the semester that we had four really good TAs. Then last semester, two were good, two were okay. So I did compare it, and I actually did have to change some of the grades of one of the TAs because um, I guess this is her first time teaching a class like this. Uh, but yeah, there was there was some discrepancy um, that I had to adjust. And you had the handbook, handbook. Pardon me? TA handbook. Yes, I did create a TA manual uh, so that every week I expect them to sort of follow it the best possible. But once again, it also depends on the TA, right? Like some are more shy, some are, uh, you know, more assertive with these things. But um, the TA manual sort of helps them to kind of keep the uh, participation activities more consistent, or hope so. Anyways. And the other good data point would be to compare the final exam yeah. grades from each group. Yeah, that's so, true. I have not done yes. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Um, very practical questions. How big was the lecture? Uh, what size were the seminars? How many seminars were there? How did you get rooms? Uh, I, I know you had. I know you had an AD behind you, so that probably helped, right? But uh, um, uh, and kind of TA feedback. I'm interested in, because it seems pretty intense for TAs, given the general what a TA looks like generally across campus. This one seems particularly intense. So they kind of the, the, uh, I'll do the how many students are yeah. in the class in the T, and then you can talk about how you pull strings. <laughs> um, so there are approximately 200 students in the lecture, uh, 200 uh, in the winter and 180 in the fall semester, so approximately 200. Each seminar has no more than 25 students, so anywhere between 20 and 25 students. Uh, there are eight seminars in total, four full-time TAs, each TA is responsible for two seminars. So their, their grading is only based on those two seminars. So they have anywhere between 40 to 50 students that they're responsible for, not taking into consideration who drops the class and obviously who doesn't submit assignments. So um, in terms of TA feedback, um, I, I, am, I didn't hear any complaint. We had one TA who was commuting from Toronto, um, so she was able to sort of come on Fridays um, to do back-to-back -back seminars, um, but she says that everything was, you know, pretty straightforward and she didn't have to do a lot of prep on her part because she knew the material. So I, I haven't really heard anything specific from any TAs. We did have a, a meeting with some of the TAs and, um, you know, the feedback yes. was pretty positive, yeah. but um, yeah, I, I, I think they're okay with the um, amount of grading and it also because it's not, they're not doing 200 you know, in week eight, and then they have two weeks to submit the grade, they're kind of doing a little bit every week. Plus they get to know the students as well, mm -hmm. and they really enjoy that part, um, the, the moderating so, part. So I would say on that front too, I think in my college at least, and it would vary across the university, the model uh, in some of our, our courses for TAs now is that they primarily do grading, and they don't teach students. So they have office hours where they're not very busy, and for weeks, they may not have very much to do, and then they're inundated, right? So, so that question of intensity is an interesting one uh, in that there's greater expectations to do more over the seminar or on a, on a more consistent basis, week to week. But, but I'm not sure whether it, I, th I would think they thought it, it was 
it was less onerous when those really intense times came because they had a, a fixed number of students, um, expectations about what, what was going to be their grading responsibilities, and better able to organize their time as opposed to having 200 essays dumped on you and you now have to grade them within the next week and a half, right, which is typically how our model works, but having lots of free time in between. So, you know, it's a different way of organizing it, but I think they found it also a better experience. Yeah. So, so the other thing too is because they are consistently talking about the assignments, they get less emails about, oh, how do I write a research assignment? Uh, you know, what do you mean by APA style? You know, so because they every week they they are taking about 10, 15 minutes to talk about what's due, and the and the assignments are scattered in four different components. They're getting less questions, uh, less students sort of bugging them to help them. So that, that also helps as well with the time. In terms of scheduling, um, Troy, you might actually be better placed to answer that than me because I, I had already abandoned the department by then. Uh, <laughs> so, but, but I think there, we ran into several uh, issues, I think. One is, yes, logistically this is more <laughs> complex, right? So. Uh, but I think scheduling was reasonably cooperative. In a lot of back and forth, but yeah. And yeah. One of the reasons why the slot, is, the lecture slot, is in the 5:30 is because we we needed that lecture early in the week, and so we had to compromise on. This oh yeah, thank you. Yeah. So we had we had to compromise on on the time slot for the first week, and then trying to get the number of the seminars at the end of the week is also a bit a bit tricky. So if you have if you try to scale this up to larger numbers, that also becomes more complicated because then you need to squeeze the seminars into the Thursday and, and Friday. So there are some logistical issues, but yes, yeah, scheduling was good in working with us. It just took a little bit of back and forth to, to get it right. Uh, I might just say too that uh, the idea was uh, that we have been floating around that um, given more numbers, depending on how that happens with our introductory course, that it would, might be better to have two sections uh, of the course rather than trying to deal with the much. This seems to be a sweet spot, uh, the 200, and we are very concerned with quality, very concerned with quality, that going this way, Dennis, we've, we've had discussions about this, that the first thing that can go is quality. If you're trying to solve a 600 uh, member class, Thank you. I'm just curious about resourcing on that because four uh, 1.0 TAs for a 200 person course is actually relatively high. So did you actually increase resourcing to be able to do this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and that's, that's one of those questions. But I think we felt that, or I felt it certainly, I think Troy would agree, I'm going to put words in his mouth, is that in face of, you know, sort of, recommendations from the external consultants on the quality assurance and that the, the, the opportunity to give our graduate students real teaching opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I can remember when I did my PhD, being able to be a teaching assistant was incredibly important for my development as an academic and as an educator. And, and as an undergrad student, that, that was an incredibly opp great opportunity. I can remember more about sort of experiences in those seminar groups. And I actually can remember some very meaningful TAs more than I can remember some of my profs that I had in first year. I kind of go, yeah, I remember that prof in that history class, but I really remember the TA because they were phenomenal. So, you know, that, that varies, of course, but, but those can be really important opportunities. And as a university, we're talking a lot about high impact practices, including small group experiences. And so there was a decision that we really need to be prepared to invest in that. And, and yes, so, you know, we're a public institution, not everything generates profits. And, and yes, we need to reallocate resources and we need to think about how that, that looks. But if we value it, then, then we, should, we should do it. And, and I think it's been a success in that regard, so. Yeah. I just have a comment. Sure. Um, at, with four TAs for 200 students, you're still nowhere near science. <laughs> I have 86 students and I have four TAs, but oh, they wow. teach labs. Right. Okay. right. Right. So you're still nowhere near, and we have 
smaller ratios than that for some of our courses mm. where their labs are particularly risky and we need to have quite mm. small groups in the lab. So you're still nowhere near what we're doing. Mm. Um, and we, we're probably higher than that in first year because each TA would have f uh, about 100 students, but they only see them every other week. So they only see them half the time. Okay. Um, but just to put that in perspective, like <coughs> four TAs, I'm thinking four TAs for 200 students, that's not that many. <laughs> Maybe we can talk about that's good. We're going to note that down. Yes. <laughs> Got that. We have a comment over here. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if there was any negative comments from the students or any part of the online menus or options that you had that didn't work that well or that you're considering changing? So, um, of course, we've had a couple of a few negative comments, mostly coming from upper year students taking this class. Um, so this class was designed specifically for first year students. The upper year students said things like, you know, the seminars are useless for me because I know how to write, or I think I know how to write a research <laughs> assignment paper, um, or, you know, it's too basic, or some of the diving deeper, I don't need to know the additional information because I have the background. So. That's, that's one um, comment. Um, from first year students, a few of them, uh, it, the negative comments would be more catered towards the, the online component because they're not ready for that kind of individual work. Uh, but I actually teach like uh, an, a, a first year uh, online class. It's just entirely online, right? So, I mean, it's just a different kind of teaching environment for them and I guess they're not ready for that, you know, um, that part where, oh, I have to go online, you know, read something, <laughs> do something, and then, and then what, what do I do now, right? So they're not, they're not prepared for that yet. But I think after week eight, week nine, then they understand, okay, well, this, this all kind of comes together, and the TA will help me if I don't ex uh, understand anything. So yeah, those are the two main complaints from upper year students who don't think the seminars are useful, and from first year students who think that the online's a little bit intimidating. So you wouldn't consider changing uh, yes. No, no, I, I actually really like how it's set up from an instructor's point of view, from a TA's point of view, and you know, the, the evaluations have been pretty good. Yeah, so. they are good. Yeah. We may have time for one or two last comments. I'll hand it over to the Chair of Political Science. Uh oh. <laughs> Just, I, 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 Nanita, this is probably directed more towards you, but a, a question about the challenge of offering a lecture. We're kind of sticking mostly to the concepts and ideas, and you mentioned maybe not being able to be as quite as interactive as you were before. You know, when, when we lecture in our other classes, we're used to sort of adding current events mm -hmm. and, and interacting with students and maybe generating some debate. So can you tell me about the challenges of keeping that lecture fresh and kind of exciting for the students and for yourself, but also trying to stick to that, you know, let's get the concepts out and not have yeah, within a strict amount of, of time. Yeah, so what I do is I make sure I go through all the slides first. You know, so the first half an hour, I'm just that boring <laughs> person talking about the concepts. And then after that, I will sort of go back and revisit some of the slides and say, OK, well, this is happening right now. And this kind of relates to this. What do you think? And then I'll open it up for discussion. But I try to sort of make sure that I finish all of those slides and the information that I have to first before sort of engaging in it. So sometimes I have time, sometimes I don't. And obviously, as I'm talking and I'm discussing and I'm throwing examples, students will stop me and ask questions. I'm not dismissing them. I'll just maybe take two questions and then I say, OK, well, we have to continue on. And then I'll just finish the rest. And then I'll come back if we have time. But it seems to work so far. So there's one week, I think it's week two on ideology, where you know I'm doing a lot of exp explanation because a lot of it is new to them, like what is reform liberalism, you know, neoconservatism. So I'm taking a bit more time. And that's probably the most challenging of all the weeks because I usually don't have much time to finish all the slides. But other than that, it's pretty. So, so when, when I used to lecture the traditional 1150 course, ideologies, I'd always give myself two weeks and I would take two months. So right, you know, this yeah. is the problem, right? Yeah. So, so that is a particularly challenging area. And that's why the diving deeper that week is one of the things I think is very important is the historical context of how ideologies mm -hmm. evolve. There's no time to talk about that, right? All you can talk about is this is what socialism is, this is what conservatism is, this is what liberalism is. So the diving deeper is actually, it's really boring because it's me uh, sitting at my desk saying, see it? 
No. <laughs> There's only one minute and not enough time. Talking for about 10 minutes about just sort of saying, so you've learned what these terms are. Where did they come from? Here's all this exciting history, which I think is exciting. They may not. And it's, it's sort of elaborating on all that stuff. And I think it's good because I got it down to 10 minutes as opposed to two months. But nevertheless, so, you know, and it's, it's sort of like, uh, but that is, that is a huge challenge for sure. I had a student who said, do we really have to know all the stuff that dude said? The dude. Uh, the dude. <laughs> I feel so hip and cool. I'm a dude now. That's awesome. So that's him. I, yeah, I there I am, there. sitting in my <laughs> office. <laughs> Do you want to hear it? Yes, every word the dude said is important. <laughs> Absolutely, that's it. Uh, a last comment or question? I was just thinking how um, great it is with the emphasis on continuity between. Um, like within a module, even week to week and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And I was wondering if you also took this opportunity to um, create more continuity between this initial course and some of the courses that they'll encounter in second, third, and fourth year, and if you had any challenges with that. Um, I don't teach third and fourth year. Um, second year, um, <coughs> I don't think we have. Is there any course that's similar to this in the second year? No, but I think no. the question is more about kind Just, of preparatory yeah. for those courses. Yeah. I think what we did, the four modules are not, they're not just chosen randomly. So we, and this was one of our big debates. Mm -hmm. I think we had long discussions, Nanita, Carol, and myself, about what, what is needed in a first year course. And so, so there's all sorts of things that when I teach, used to teach this course that are not in this course. And there's stuff that Carol taught that, is not in this course. And this was hard, right? Because we have to let go. And that's why it's all about content. Mm -hmm. But at another level, it's not about content. It's not about saying we have to cover everything that we think a political scientist needs to know. But what are the key core elements of the discipline of political science that we think students should be exposed to, at least in an introductory way, that would prepare them in the second and third year. So explicitly, like it doesn't necessarily scaffold directly to those courses, but but I think that as a as a as a sort of a preparatory intro course, I think we've gotten away from thinking about it as what when, when I took first year courses, they were called survey courses, in the sense that you covered a bit of everything. We're not trying to cover a bit of everything. We're trying to give you the key concepts you're going to need to succeed in the, in the upper years. And so it's, that, it's preparatory rather than a survey. We're not attempting to cover everything. And, and in fact, I think as in our department, what we think of as the second year courses, I, I call them gateway yeah. courses. That, that those courses are actually, if you want to do IR, the second year international relations course is the gateway to that. Mm -hmm. This is the gateway to the discipline. Those are the gateways to more specific subject matter expertise. Yeah. All right, so on that then, I think uh, we're out of time. We're a little past time. Uh, so I'll just uh, thank everyone for attending. And mm -hmm. please, let's uh, give a round of applause for our panelists who did such a great job. And, uh, we, uh, we're always welcome to uh, or, or open to getting questions or inquiries. So I think you could, you could email Nanita, Dennis, or Carol, or myself if you have other, other questions that weren't, didn't come up today. Uh, the next Hub event is February 8th, uh, and it's going to be on indigenizing curriculum. So I would yeah, I encourage people if, to, to come and check that out. And it's going to be led by Kim Anderson of uh, Family Relations and Applied Nutrition in our, in our department. I'm not sure all of what Kim has planned for us, but I'm sure it'll, it's going to be fabulous. So awesome. Thank you again.